All right, guys, we're going to be getting started in just a second. Uh, thank you for the turnout. Um, yeah. Cool. So there are signing tickets going around the room. Please make sure to sign in. We really appreciate it. Um, it allows us to get food like this. Uh, you'll notice there's salad. Um, you should really thank everybody at Silence, especially our speakers and Nate Ben, uh, thank you for allowing us to have this great food. Um, that said, there are a couple of things that are coming up this week that you guys need to know about. The first one is scale. Uh, I guess it's just fell. <laughs> Okay, it's close. It's close enough. Um, okay, so scale is happening this Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. How many people here are going? Okay, keep those hands up. How many people got my email? Okay, did anybody not get those emails? Okay, cool. So we're good. The email that you have says that on Saturday at noon, we're going to be doing a group photo. Please, please bring your Swift shirt that day. We're going to be doing, trying to take over the center of the conference hall and doing the largest group photo that they've probably ever seen. It should be a lot of fun. Now, we want everybody to have their Swift shirts so we can identify you guys and uh, make sure it looks really cool. If you don't have a Swift shirt or you have a medium because this, the new shirts haven't arrived yet, please just wear a black shirt. So everybody should be good there. Now, if you have any questions, I'm here. Um, I gave contact information, so you should be good. Um, I hope to see everybody there, and if you um, have any questions at any point during the conference, please do not hesitate to contact us. That said, um, we're going to be starting this Friday the uh, training, the Linux trainings that we talked about. This week it's going to be web services continued. The group is almost full. We have eight people, I believe, right now. So if you want to go, make sure that you sign up soon. It's on our Facebook group. If you want to go, they uh, will listen to whatever you want and do different trainings depending on who's attending. So it's really cool. It's really personalized training. I can't stress that enough. You didn't like the huge groups. This is going to be six people for as long as you need. And we're going to be doing this weekly. So there, the same stuff will be going on if you're going to scale. But if you're not going to scale for whatever reason, you can do that as well. And we'll be happy with the following. With that, I want to introduce our speaker today. He's from Silence. His name is Ben Bakers. He's going to be presenting on some cool stuff, uh, cybersecurity war stories. Uh, these are generally the cool things that happen in the industry. If you're not sure if you want to do cybersecurity, if you want to do network security, network administration, these types of stories will help give you an idea of what the industry is like. And with that, I think I'm going to let him get started. So let's give a round of applause. Uh, pretty easy presentation today. Uh, by show of hands, how many people here are interested in security? So, okay. Uh, network security, network administration, application security. Okay. All right, cool. <laughs> that works. My background is in network security. I'll, I'll kind of get into that in a little bit. Uh, how many of you have heard of science? Or keep that better than Google. All right, so who, who is Silence, right? So most of us came from big companies. Uh, Silence is relatively a new startup. We started, I say relatively because we've been in business for about three and a half years. Um, most of us came from uh, the Foundstones, the McAfee's, uh, Cisco, uh, and we came together with this idea. And this idea is to basically be a next generation product, uh, a replacement for AD. Has any of you, have any of you guys read Hacking Exposed? Hacking Exposed, okay. So, Joe, of course. Stuart McClure. <laughs> so Stuart McClure, who is our CEO, uh, he, he was the CTO of McAfee previous to starting Silence. Uh, and he would refer to himself as the Chief Apology Officer. Okay? Because he would be, when, when McAfee or a, a product wouldn't work, that McAfee would send him in and he'd have to apologize to the, the CISO and the CEO. Uh, you know, and, and kind of help under help understand why the product failed. After doing this for a couple of years, as one can imagine, it got very, very old, right? And so he decided there has to be a better way. And so him and a gentleman by the name of Brian Prima, who is, was the chief scientist of, of McAfee, met together in a garage and decided, hey, how can we improve upon this? How can we how can we how, how can we become the, the best next generation uh, product? Okay. And so really, uh, what do we do? 
Okay, prevention through artificial intelligence. And how do we do it? Has anyone here is anyone here familiar with the Human Genome Project? DNA, like mapping DNA, right? So that's the easiest way to describe this, is we take executables, understand what makes good software and what makes bad software. So there are, there are features of an executable uh, that are deterministically good, right? So you, we know that if it's signed, you know, typically that'd be a good, a good thing, right? If it's unsigned, bad. And so there's millions and millions and millions and millions of these individual features. And what we do is use artificial intelligence to model against those features to identify uh, what actually is making malicious software bad and good software good. That all boils down to an algorithm that runs on the endpoint. If it's good, it allows it to run. If it's bad, it blocks it. No signatures, no heuristics, static feature abstraction. And if you guys have questions throughout this, feel free. I mean, this is this is interactive, so you know, I want you guys to to, to participate. If you have something to do, just let me know. So what do I do? Well, uh, identify risk, right? So that's 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 primarily my job. Uh, a little bit about my background is I've been with Simon since the beginning. Previous, I was at Poundstone for a year. It's been at Guidance Software. Uh, 15 plus years in security consulting. I, my core focus is penetration testing, risk assessments, forensics, that type of stuff. I ask them. Um, the most common question when someone asks me, well, what do you do? And I kind of think about it for a second, is realistically, my, my answer to them on, on most cases is something like of the following. Okay. Has anyone here heard of the uh, anyone here heard of the the, the, the candle problem? <clears throat> candle problem. Okay. So the candle problem is when you're given a, a candle, a box of tacks, and you say, "Okay, I want you to put this candle on the wall." And most people attack it. The similarities are pretty pretty common. So they try to attack the, the candle and all using the tacks. Light it on fire, it nuts. Right. So they try to make a little little using the, using the tacks and try to. They try to make like a little, uh, like a little shelf to hold the, the candle on, right? It doesn't work, right? Now the solution to this problem is you take the box that's holding the tax, you tack the box to the wall, and you put the candle in the box, right? And so that's all security consulting is doing, right? Specifically, when you talk about network security, and when you say something, the environment has all of these different technologies, right? They could networks, applications, uh, they have all these different processes. How does a person get a username? Right? How does a person? How how are the being admins? Uh, you know, checking. You know, checking or doing updates. All of these different technology pieces fit together, and it's your job to figure out how to best utilize them to provide value and identify risk. Make sense? <coughs> so, kind of the agenda here, uh, but uh, really, I want to kind of give you guys an idea of some of the the case studies. So, these are examples that I've worked with, been involved in, or know, or have firsthand knowledge. So we're going to talk about uh, some. We're going to talk about a couple of different clients. Obviously, need to change. Uh, all of our work is under NDAs. I don't like getting sued. It's not fun. Um, but so I'll give you an example on airport financial company, auto manufacturer. Uh, we'll do some. We'll do some IR case studies on Carplay. Uh, we'll do some death by Microsoft. And really, these are stories that kind of get you excited to kind of understand when I go in or when one of my guys goes in to do an assessment, the types of things that we're paid to do. I mean, we're, we're paid to hack them. It's a lot of fun. <clears throat> uh, at the end, I'll, I'll talk about what I think is the next big concern, right? So, what what is on the forefront? What do I? What am I? What keeps me up? All right. So, enterprise security services. Um, I have a picture. Of, what is that? Um, crown jewels, right? So, every organization has something that they consider to be their crown jewels, and it is your job as a security consultant if you're doing a pen test to identify what that is and identify ways to access that. Uh, now, depending upon the focus of the assessment, whether or not it's an internal assessment, whether or not you're doing a, a social engineering assessment, the method of going about stealing, so to speak, the crown jewels may be different, okay? But ultimately, as a business, they're doing something, provide, they're, they're making money. Usually, it, it boils down to a couple of different things. So, the secret sauce, right? The Coke ingredient. <coughs> Uh, in, in some cases, PII, personal identifiable information. Does anyone know what this is from? <coughs> I'm dating myself. Trading places. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so uh, the orange source, right? So, if I know something really bad is going to happen, uh, and you know, and they're they're trading commodities, and I and I have access to that information, 
I can make a lot of money, right? If I get caught, what happens? I go to jail because it's inside trade. I have you know, information that hasn't been released. But those are the types of things that make that can make a potential impact on us and that they care about. And this isn't, you know, there's a lot of other things. These are just kind of some generalities to start thinking about what does an enterprise care about? And ultimately it's going to be different, right? It's going to depend upon what they're doing in terms of the providing. So let's talk about some, some case studies. Yeah. So these are all kind of, they, they expand, I didn't pick all of them from this year, some of them go back, uh, you know, so some of them go back a couple of years, but ultimately these are each individual different assessments that I took away from something and I learned something from. Either to become a better security consultant, to, to you know, to, you know, just open my eyes to risk in general. The airport. So this is probably 10 years ago, nine, 10 years ago. It was one of my first my first uh, engagements at Foundstone. Okay. So they sent me out, I was hired, sent out, go do an internal penetration test. Is anyone familiar with what an internal penetration test is? Should I go over what penetration testing is? Okay, so I'll go over what penetration testing is. So penetration testing is where I go in and I, I pretend I'm the bad guy. Right, so I'm going to go in, try to identify vulnerabilities. I'm trying to, I'm going to try to exploit those vulnerabilities, and then I'm going to try to get access to what? Back up a slide, the crown jewels. And so it's my job to really try to understand what does the airport really care about. So in this case, the airport had roughly somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 folks, right? So that's networks, so that's uh, servers, switches, routers, that's devices, right? Plug into the network. Uh, in addition, they really cared about accessing flight information. They cared about financial information. This particular airport did hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue a year. Uh, if you impact that revenue, obviously, you know, that's what causes layoffs and other bad things to happen. And so if you're able to embarrass them or show that their data is insecure or that data is compromised, you know, to a point where uh, they have to, you know, they have to pay for your life box or your uh, your all of that insurance that ultimately is free to you once your information gets compromised, but it's money to them. So they're paying millions and millions of dollars in fines, whether it be regulatory compliance or for something, right? And so they, at the end of the day, they want to be secure. <laughs> now, this one is actually really special because prior to this, I was doing mostly forensics, and you know, after college, I had a different expectations as to what business casual was, right? I had my own definition. And at that time, the business casual of me was jeans and a polo and I was good. So I show up to on-site. <laughs> I show up on-site to, uh, uh, to my first meeting ever, right? So I had never done, I'd never done work with Brownstone before. I'd never done, uh, I'd never done work with this large of a, uh, this, this type of client. I had no idea. And I, and I stroll in in my jeans and my polo, thinking, okay, this is good. Like, I got this. First thing I ran into is my project manager at the time, and she has a shit fit, right? I mean, she's just like, what, what are you wearing? And at this point, like, I have, you know, I have my own definition like that. You know, we said business casual. This is what business casual is meant to be for the last 10 years, you know? Jeans and t-shirt. It's casual. Business. I got a collar. Like, <laughs> what more do you want? Needless to say, I was uh, corrected rather quickly, okay? But those are the types of Things that I have experience. With. Hopefully, you're smarter than I was. But uh, you know, those are the types of things that, when you're going out and considering consulting, that are important, right? Customer facing. You can be an amazing technical. You can have an amazing technical ability, but if you're not customer facing, what good are you, right? If I have to keep, if, I, if I'm hiring consultants who are going to go represent, they're the face of the company, you know. And so they want. There has to be a certain amount of expectations in terms of how they dress, how they, you know, how they interact, uh, and all of this is very important. But uh, it was just funny because, needless to say, uh, guess what? I never did again. Showed up in jeans and t-shirt. Hold right, on. Okay. Anyone know what this is? Besides a ninja, cool ninja. So it's a minute for it's all, it's all a minute for uh, console. Does anyone know? What Metasploit is. Okay, so we got a couple of people. So Metasploit, uh, so Metasploit is think about it as an application of, of payloads, right? So when you go and do a pen test, 
the first thing is what, what, what is the first thing that you want to do? Identify a vulnerability, right? So you identify a vulnerability. After that, you want to exploit the vulnerability. Well, in order to exploit the vulnerability, you need to have exploit code. And Metasploit is essentially a tool that allows you to do that, right? So it provides you with shell access and it provides you with basically a database of exploit code that you can use to pawn and uh, pillage your way throughout the network. Find vulnerabilities. So exploiting the vulnerability, right? So we use Metasploit to exploit the vulnerability. Uh, at any given time, I would be shocked. So well, let me let me take a step back. Who wants to who wants to guess what the percentage of times I go in and plug into a network, do an internal assessment or do an internal pen test, and I'm able to achieve domain admin? Everybody know what domain admin is? Okay, so basically the highest level of privilege on the Windows environment. Who, who wants to wager a guess in terms of percentage of success? Ninety. Ninety. Okay. What's another one? Okay. It's actually right in between those two. It's eighty-five percent. Out of every single, and I, and I started tracking this a long time ago. 85% of any time I go in and I plug in, I'm able to get domain out. Okay? And as a network administrator, as a lot of you, that should be scary, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's very scary. Uh, now, for those, and I would say that other 15%, they usually fall into one of two categories. Either I was restricted, it was a small environment, meaning there was only five or six systems, or it was a new environment. Meaning they had just purchased all Windows 7, so there was nothing legacy in the environment. Um, and if I go back in five years or four years, do that same assessment, now they have legacy stuff, which means, you know, all you gotta do is just one, right? If you're 99% secure and you have 2,000 nodes, 1% is still a pretty big number of possible targets. Pillage. Now, don't ever put pillage in, in, into your know, customer facing reports, obviously. This is more like, you know the anatomy of the attack. How I got how I got domain admin, or how I how I was able to you know circumvent your security controls, and this is the result. What did I actually get? <coughs> yeah. Yeah. So and keep in mind. Right? Up, and, it, and from a psychological perspective, up to this day, right? So I had, so this was my first big day and my first big new job, right? And so I was super excited. Uh, and so, I mean, I literally, at that night, I can remember, I had dreams of Oracle exploits going in, before going into work, right? So, I mean, I, like, I was ready. Of course, I was a little upset when I got in and I was yelled at for my clothing choice. But, you know, it, it is what it is. I've got thick skin. Arrived on site at 9 a.m. What I didn't put in is I got yelled at at 9.15, but um, <laughs> plugged into the conference room at approximately 9.30, enumerated in the main controller. So first thing I did, I just like, all right, well, where's the main controller? Let's figure this out. I had the enterprise domain admin by 10 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, uh, so there's, well, so yeah, so that, so there's apps. Like, I'm like jumping for joy at this point. It's like, I roll in, I'm the new guy. You know, plug in like I am the you know like I was ecstatic, and then I realized, what am I gonna do for the next week? Like oh. I'm like, because oh. here's the thing, right? Is for everything that I find, I've got to write a recommendation, and so when I find domain admin at the beginning of the week, that means there's going to be a lot of recommendations, and so what people don't miss or what I didn't realize is what's just as important as your ability to be provide that technical expertise is your ability to write. Okay, report writing, huge in consulting. Anyone, why? Why do you think report writing is so important when you're doing computer, when you're doing security consulting? People have to be able to understand what you found and how, you have to basically dumb it down to something they can understand, not the technical. Sure, experience. and the, the deliverable. Yeah. So, I mean, I would just, so if I were to guess, right? I mean, and this is, you know, kind of a broad range. I mean, what you're you're talking ten thousand for a small assessment. You could it could be seven figures for a large. And so if I go in and I hack them seven ways from Sunday, and I don't provide them with anything of value, or if I don't express, or if I don't show them how I did it and what what remediation efforts that they need to do to in order to fix it, what good is it? You know, it doesn't provide them with any actual value. This is this is So. Needless to say, you probably won't be able to do this. But uh, 
from there, I mean, basically, I took coming out and uh, I was able to enumerate. I was able to enumerate other other networks, other segments. I was able to identify credential misuse, number one issue in organizations. Reusing passwords, especially like shared shared accounts, admin, whatever. Um, you know, and with, with that level of access, I was able to get bigger text passwords and all that fun stuff. Um, ultimately, what happened was I was able to use those, and they have this little cool PCI network, right? And so you guys actually have something really similar uh, because I did an assessment many many years ago. Uh, so you have enclaves, right, or essentially enclaves, and so all of your regulatory type of security. And so you have like serious security controls, you have VPNs in place, you have all of these different types of technologies that are protecting this data. Well, and this particular place had two-factor authentication, which is impressive because like I said, this was 10 years ago. And so they had a jump box with two-factor authentication. Problem was the uh, network administrator, or one of the network administrators, had a soft token on his desktop. And so I was able to compromise his credentials, use his soft token, generate the key, Log in over the VPN and have access to all of their special fun stuff they're trying to do. So that's that's one thing, right? Is and then we're talking in the space of a week, right? I mean, I don't have months, or I mean, our engagements aren't months or years. If you're an advanced persistent threat, how you know? Or I mean, if you go by the latest statistics in Verizon, it's something like 285 days before you realize that you've been owned. Depressing. Any questions on that? Okay, so that was kind of the first part of the assessment that you got. The second part is social engineering. How many people know what social engineering is? Okay, some more things. All right, so for those who don't know, it's basically manipulation, right? So I have consultants who really don't like doing this because they feel really, really bad uh, about lying, right? And about, about having to manipulate someone to the point where Others excel at it, like <laughs> scary. It's just you know, it's like if they, if, you know, one step over and you might not be. I mean, you're riding that line. Kind of deal. <clears throat> so, a couple of key parts. Dress the part. Okay. Meaning, if you're going to go into a professional business, right, and you're trying to, uh, you're trying to pretend to be somebody such as. Uh, uh, with authority, right? Don't go in in t-shirts and jeans, right? Dress the part. <laughs> Have a good reason. Ex excuses are great. One of my biggest, one of my, my most successful social engineering tactics, really, it, it involves fishing. So it's kind of a two-part exercise. It, it involves fishing and uh, telespooping, right? So telespooping is essentially the ability to, when I call you, or when I call you, I can show you what number, or I can spoof the number that I'm sending you, right? So like bill collectors, right? So that's why they need references, so that, you know, if, if, if I have your mom's number, right, or your dad's number, and you're not paying your bills, I'm gonna pretend that I'm your mom or dad calling you, you're most likely gonna answer, right? Mm -hmm. Same concept. And so what happens is, is you create a fictitious email. So you do something that looks obviously bad, right? So you have your victim in mind, maybe she's the, maybe she's the expense lady, right? So you say, hey, I'm unable to open this expense report, and it's, it's named, you know, something really complicated to zip file. You send it to her from an obviously fictitious email. And so she gets it, okay? So it's right in her inbox. Next thing you do, if they have, uh, you, you give her a call, right? So you, immediately you send it, and immediately you give her a call. And you spoof, you can spoof the company's name. You can, if they have a direct IT support number, you can spoof it. And you say, hi, you know. Miss victim, right? I just noticed that by the way, uh, an email came in two minutes ago with this subject and with this title, right? Don't click on it, and of course, you already click on it, right? But what are you doing? Here? Well, you're, you're, you're establishing trust, right? So, you have trust. So, she's so this lady, she just got this clearly bad email, and then two minutes later, a minute later, she gets a phone call. She looks down at the number, it's from, it's from within the company, or maybe even if you get lucky, you get started. She can recognize that it's IT calling. She picks it up, and immediately you're trying to save the day because, and you have some, you have some story about, oh, this this circumvented our email filters, right? It's a keystroke logger. I need to do X, Y, and Z. Boom. And done. And how effective this is, Gary? Uh, I have actually done that that particular assessment on CISOs. 
So a board will come in outside to like, you know, like the actual board will want to do an assessment on their security. You're about a hole. Some power. So always have a good reason. Confident. As soon as you start struggling, you know, or if you're not confident, you, you're not, and you're not right in their face, or you're not, you're not really very clear on the, what the task that you want them to do, they start raising down. So if you don't give them an option, if you don't give them time to think about this, or whether or not this is a good idea or a bad idea, you know, chances are they'll do it and be a smart. You know, there should be, number four should always have a smart. Like if you're, if you're creepy in a, in a trench coat, <laughs> less likely to be a smart. <laughs> you know, just probably goes under the the part. <laughs> so, back to this airport. So this was my second part. So this was week two. I come back in, I understand how the airport is, I understand the layout. We have a polo shirt, which is ironic because he yelled at me the first day I wore a polo shirt. <laughs> and uh, a red phone. I remember this red phone specifically because I always see, when I see this red phone, like I, all the movies with the president on a red phone, you know, NORAD or something, right? Like, Something bad really gonna happen if that phone rings. Well, in this particular case, this was uh, so there was no limits in this particular airport, which hindsight could probably should have been smart, but it was pretty much a free fall. And so the target that we picked uh, was the was essentially the control tower, right? So you had like a, a control tower, I don't know exact flight, flight, flight status, right? And literally all we had to do is we borrowed, um, we borrowed some, we figured out what vendors they use. So we understood, okay, they use Mac products, they use semantic products, blah, blah, blah. And we, luckily, most of us have swag from going to conferences. We had a couple of uh, in space in this Mac feed, which we actually were employed at Mac feed, so it made things a little easier. Uh, Mac people put those on, said, hello, yeah, he let us up, we're, we're here to do maintenance. No problem. Shh, open the door. Uh, I mean, this is like, this is for, I mean, like, it was like, it was literally, in my mind, it was like this. This is flight control for a space shuttle, but same concept, like, and everybody is so focused on their, like, you just walk in and you're, you're, you're there to do a job. Now, I should mention, you know, all these assessments, right, you have permission, okay? There are get out of jail free cards, um, especially with social engineering, people get pissed. And so I've had people, I've done assessments like in banks or high security areas where guys with guns come and drag you off, right? And, and so what's interesting is sometimes you can show them this get out of jail free card and let you off. And then you write them up still, right? Because they let you off. Because most of the time they don't verify. So what, I mean, I could have just had something written with the CEOs, but you didn't actually call the CEO or you called them around and verified. You just assume they're not supposed to be there. Then there are other times which they don't even want to hear it, and it's like thrown up against the wall, put on the little zip tie handcuffs, and you just gotta wave that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any questions on kind of social engineering, or or we'll call it the, the airport scenario? Nope. Okay. Show me the money. This happened this year. Which once I get into it, it will blow your mind. It was, I just couldn't believe that even in this day and age, simple problems like this still exist. But it's a testament of you know understanding and being diligent. In, in this case, your SDLC software development lifecycle process of making sure your stuff is secure. So uh, let's go through the uh, the application. So when we do an assessment, we talked about doing the internal pen test, right? Basically, I plug in, I scan everything, I find the vulnerability, I exploit, I exploit the vulnerability, and I continue exploiting the vulnerability until either my time is out or I have something about it, okay? Application security is a little different in most cases. Uh, it's not as, it's more focused on identifying vulnerabilities than it is identifying paths to kind of the pillaging, right? So expanding your influence. That makes sense. So when we're looking at an application, these are the kind of areas that we're going to go through. First, we have to discover the application. We have to know exactly how it's working. So we spider it, and we, we go through, and we understand, you know, okay, what parameters are what? Uh, you know, how does it work? What configuration settings are there? You know, do they forget anything, you know, silly, so to speak? We walk to this, right? Authorization, identity right? session management, and so on and so forth. Business logic is important too, as I'll come to. Um, but all these are all different areas when we're assessing an application that we look at. 
So the target in this particular case is mobile application. So uh, send and receive money with this application. And it would, it would not surprise me if some of you have actually probably used this application, either the mobile or the web. Very popular. Uh, hundreds of millions of dollars these companies work. And essentially, like I said, we mobile. It was an Android application, uh, but it was essentially a mirror up there. You could do the same same exact type of activity on the on the website as well. But we were focused on the risk was focused on uh, the Android portion. <coughs> we found the golden goose. So essentially, we could, as it says right here, so we would be able to send money for that. So say, I mean, I want to send you. Well, I could change that. I can say, well, I'm going to send you five thousand dollars, and you're going to receive five thousand dollars. But I really only want to be. I only want to lose one dollar, right? Cool. Yeah. <laughs> it reminds me a lot of uh, like when I was a kid. With my with, yeah. It's like with bargaining with your. You, you know, I've got kids now, but when I was I, three, four brothers and sisters. Yeah, I'll give you one piece of candy. You give me five, but it's the same. It's yeah. It's 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 right. That's what I got. <laughs> and so, like I said, this was, I mean, this was three, four months ago. So, turn one dollar into however much money you want. Step one, deposit one dollar into your account. Okay. Step two, send money to a friend. Preferably one that you trust, because they're going to get a lot of money. <laughs> Modify the send money request. Crap. Now, as developers, it's important to, to be, you know, to have these naming conventions uh, in order to be able to read through code and say, okay, now if you saw that reading code, send money, what would you think it actually did? Has something to do with probably sending money. So it's probably pretty important for Okay. Step four, modest, modify the receive money parameter to whatever you want. And that was all it took. Now we didn't test it for a billion dollars, but we did test it for four or five thousand dollars. And so there is one step in here that I did not put in. Uh, but essentially, what it relied on was there was a primary process and a backup process. And the backup process did not validate these results. So you, if you were able to, to force, so if you're able to force the service to use the backup process, didn't go through audit, didn't get validated, money. <laughs> and so remember that last time I told you about, uh, I told you about uh, business process? So, no kidding, uh, we put in a dollar, sent 500, I think we did 500, 1,000, and 5,000. Walked to the place, got our money, I'm giving away too much information. <laughs> but, uh, let's just say no one validated even at, as they were handing us $100 bills. Because all I see is, up oh, request. But if you would have looked at the logs, if you would have actually seen what was sent, you know, yeah, there's no, there's no way you should be getting $5,000, you should be getting $1. So this is some of the cool stuff that you get to see when you when you you start doing security consulting. Um, you know, I mean, and I have for every one of these that are up here because we don't have time. I have a hundred just like it. No, no kidding. You know, these aren't like the best. The best. These are what I thought of. In, you know, the last couple of days because I procrastinate just like college students. <laughs> <laughs> Step five. I forgot. Buy a small country. Right. I mean, it's it's really that. Any questions? All right. So another thing that we do a lot in from a testing perspective is embedded device in healthcare. In fact, we have an entire vertical specifically associated with that. Now, my primary responsibility as managing director is I run the pen test teams and I run all of the, the series of teams that focus on enterprise security. Uh, until we got large enough, you know, I had to do embedded before. Now how many of you think, so in terms of traditional risk, let's, let's go with this. In terms of traditional risk, how many of you immediately think of embedded devices, your fridge, uh, airline TVs, medical devices, such as infusion pumps, prevent uh, or provide you know, risk to you as, as, a, as either an employee or as a user? So I'll give you an example. Anyone heard of Target? No. <laughs> no, no target. So, is, is anyone familiar with the target? Target. Yes. So, it's, 
So, so it's basically a two two prong attack, right? You have the kind of social engineering aspect, and then what did they go through? What was the initial after they targeted the employee, got the username, password? What did they go through? HVAC, right? Because all of that stuff is plugged into your corporate network, and it's the code is twenty five years old. When you put in a PLC, it cost it could cost the PLC being. Uh, you know, in other words, uh, devices that like from from industrial control perspective, or uh, so oil and gas, those generators, oftentimes they're just plugged right into the network. You know, uh, and they're plugged right into the network. Their code is really crappily written, uh, and it, they never replace it because the devices themselves cost hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars. So it's not cost effective. And so you go into a customer who has all of these devices, and you can start breaking stuff very, very quickly. Uh, I have seen Windows 3.14, uh, Windows 3, I've seen Windows 98, all within the last two years. No joke. I've seen Windows 94, sure, no problem. Yeah. Because what happened is, okay, well, it's running in 4 and the risk of compromise is high, but the cost for me to replace this is more than, you know, it's basically going to cost me 10, 10x, 100x, 1,000x, so I'll just deal with the risk. So if it gets high, it's going to cost me 10x. You know, so what's the likelihood that it's going to cost, that I'm going to have to pay that out over the course of a number of years, right? So, I mean, that's that's all that is, basic risk, risk calculation. But then when you say, hey, look, it took us 30 seconds from the internet, and this is not small companies. I mean, you can see, I'll give you an example of Google, right? Google, anything, right? Google has the same problem. So, what do they want to protect? Well, this is where it's a little different because embedded devices pretty much means anything that's not a computer, right? Or anything that's not an enterprise, uh, it, it, what you would consider an enterprise type uh, solution, right? So. That could be, we talked about HVACs, medical device parts, huge. Nowadays, anyone gotten into the hospital or been to the doctor's office in the last five years, all those, all those devices embedded, right? Wi-Fi, usually wet if you're lucky. If not, it's unencrypted. You know, uh, it's not an area that anyone's ever focused on because they've been so busy worrying about their PCs and their laptops and servers. But it's huge, especially when you uh, could potentially kill someone because you force an infusion pump, or you force the pump to deliver too much or too little of the medication. Put it in that terms, right? I mean, it goes from, so instead of having a financial impact, right, from a security perspective, you're now concerned about risk, risk uh, of human life. And you have, to, you have to approach it that way, because if you talk to a doctor or someone who is, if you're trying to sell services or products to a hospital, you know, basically they want to know, okay, what am I going to stay out of? Because every dollar I spend on you is a dollar less than I spend on a kid with cancer. And so if you don't have a really good answer to that, you know, I mean, they, there is a, a, a battle for that. <sighs> Auto manufacturers. Man, that's kind of blown up. In fact, there's a really big uh, conference uh, out on the East Coast for Department of Transportation uh, today, and this week, obviously. This has got a lot of press. You, you can thank Chris Valset and a couple of other people um, who really like attention, right? And so they really brought attention to this particular issue. Anyone worried about their car being hacked? Why? What's that? Look at all the different types of Every one of those is an electronic device that can be manipulated. And that's not even a complete list. It's just a graphic that you want to borrow. Yeah. I mean, you have, uh, and so some of these are more serious than others, right? I mean, there's one thing about forcing someone to listen to the Queen for eight hours straight by hijacking your iPod that's plugged in, right? Or, if, but if you can mess with, if you can mess with the brakes breaking, or if you can mess with the acceleration, again, you bring in the human impact of this, and as an auto as an auto manufacturer, you really care about that kind of stuff. Because who's the first person they're going to come to? Them and sue them for lots of money. And probably not. So, I have done this for very many uh, different types of auto manufacturers. Uh, some of them are, you know, 
some of them are my best customers. Okay. Now, the, the fundamental problem with when you think of a car is you have this, which is this idea of hand bus. Okay. And so all of these different peripherals, peripheral being your navigation, peripheral being any type of device, it's all plugged in to the same primary communication channel for the most part. Uh, that operates the critical, so your gas, your acceleration, your start and stop, okay? And so it's possible, and we've, we've proven it, that you can start and stop a vehicle remotely, right? Without, because nowadays you have to push start with, with uh, mobile okay? So we're able to hijack that, that authentication and do it. You know, if you wanted to start and stop it and steal a car, we can do that. No problem. If you want to mess with the acceleration, we can do that as well. Um, you know, I mean, there's all these different types of features in that vehicle that you can completely own the mess with. And it's very important because some of those, if you get impacts on a person in the car or, you know, wherever they're at. And this is going to be, this is a big thing, right? So, uh, if you go to DEF CON or Black Hat, there's almost always a uh, talk on this. Usually by Chris or, or Chris Balsack or one of the kind of community supporters of this concept. We talked about network devices. Um, in this particular case, <coughs> they do this, this. So, backing up a year or so, a year and a half. Uh, this is one of the first medical device manufacturers that have instituted a rigorous security testing framework into their development. Right? So we do, we're talking like people who actually make the devices. Right? So you have different types of risk and people have to assess the risk different. So as a, as a manufacturer of the devices, they want to make sure their primary concern is, well, I don't want someone to, I don't want to put this into a hospital and be insecure because if someone breaks it, kills a person, I'm probably going to get sued. Okay. Financially, and so this a couple of these customers, it was unheard of two or three years ago to do this type of testing on medical device. Now FDA is going through has recommendations. There will be processes developed, I'm sure, in the coming years, and regulatory requirements on, on how devices themselves are to be handled, assessed, and then tested. Right? Because we have regulatory compliance with the data, so PI health information, that type of stuff. But how is this not important? How is it not important to make sure that whatever device you do can't kill the patient? <laughs> so, hard-coded credentials, common issue, uh, vulnerabilities in software. Again, a lot of this, a lot of these fall best practices. That leads to crappy code, which leads to lots of vulnerabilities, which leads to oper lots of opportunities to take over the operating system of the device itself. Um, a lot of these devices operate on on very custom protocols. So, you know, I mean, I'm, and I know we we're talking with Joe, I don't know Joe and Bud up there. We we're talking about a class where you know, he was essentially had to, uh, you know, make his own TC, TCIP stack, right? And have a device that you code and you code and, and be able to go through that process. Same thing applies here, right? Because if you don't know how that, what that communication looks like or how how to manipulate it, you're gonna have a really tough time. Uh, Assessing it, right, or making an impactful, uh, or providing an impactful report. Because the last thing I want to do, and the last thing you want to do, if you're going to be security consultants, is say there's no risk when there's lots of risk. You need that, right? Uh, <laughs> that's just fun. Robotic arms. So we tested, this was a few years ago, uh, we tested the ability in surgeries now to have robotic arms that are huge, right? They're huge, that are doing these very delicate tasks. And we are able to, and this was obviously not a real human, they have like dummies that you can do that to, certain, to basically uh, do certain tasks and, and test to make sure the robotic arm is functioning. And so we're, during, you know, we have the dummy out, and we have, it's simulating a live environment, we are able to manipulate the robotic arm to kill the human. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, and so if that happened in the real world, that's mind boggling. If you had never even thought about that, that could happen, that's just the tip of the iceberg. And so as your job as you know, network security engineer, security consultant, whatever it is you're trying to do, those types of things are, are, uh, are, are the risks that you're looking out for and trying to prevent. Okay. 
So any questions on kind of the, what I call classify as the offensive type stuff that I do? I know we're running short on time. What are we, are we doing pretty good? What's up? I wrote to these very quickly. Okay. Instant response. So who knows what instant response is? Basically, it's when your company gets hacked, we come and save the day. Right? Same. Heartbleed. So this was like a year ago, a year and a half ago? It's been a while. Anyone familiar with Heartbleed? Okay. Joe will record Joe. <laughs> for those that don't know, we hired Joe. He worked for us for a little while. But um, Heartbleed was really cool. So it was basically, you could, uh, you could, you could send a request to memory and then pull out some memory, chunks of memory, okay? Now, it, when, this, when this issue hit, it was like, oh my gosh, the internet is going to break, we're all going to die. <laughs> that lasted for like a day, okay? And then the patch was pushed out a day or two later, and for the most part, people forgot about it. There was, we had one uh, customer who had a, uh, their government client, and right at that time, they had an employee who had lost her key bottle, right? So she had to use static keys in order to access the VPN. Well, lo and behold, this particular government client has a lot of, has a problem with a lot of Chinese agencies, uh, who particularly, you know, on a, on a quarterly basis. And right as she logged in, right, right as she logged in, they were able to exploit this vulnerability, gain that hard-coded uh, credential, and essentially, boom, right in. So they used that static key, so now instead of having a, a random key that they use that static key, right, go right along it, full access to this government client center. As you can imagine, they were freaking out, because there was no real way to like secure this for a day or two. And so by the time they noticed it, Chinese attacker, domain admin, a bunch of other stuff. And so they're like rooted, right? And so once you have, uh, once it's rooted, it's like, it can be very difficult if you, if you don't know what you're doing, to make sure that everything, uh, the attacker is completely out of the environment. I mean, in predictive, several weeks. Death by Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft. <laughs> so this goes along the lines of understanding and identifying that good tools can be used for uh, malicious purposes. Who here knows what PS Exec is? PS Exec is a couple. So PS Exec is essentially a Microsoft tool that has really good administrative functions. It allows you to remotely interact with other services, other computers. Um, now, if you're an attacker, it's a perfect tool to use in lateral movement. Anyone? So lateral movement meaning I have I'm on box A and I want to get to box B. His exec does that. This customer was in the news. It was big IR last year. Uh, they had they so and these guys had everything. So these guys had nine. They had I mean their security budget was that of a small country. It seemed like so they had every technology available. But they could not stop this, right? Bit nine, right? So bit nine, well, this is a valid Windows application, right? Sign, it's allowed to be used. It's not malicious, but if you're able to compromise a domain admin account and use PS Exec to move in and log in and do whatever you want, well, like disable bit nine, guess what happens? You become popular. And so that's what happened in this particular, uh, this particular case. And so again, this turned into, and so there are credit card processes. They had millions of millions of millions of dollars in fines that they had to pay because they weren't compliant and made to it. Not to mention, not to mention the impact of finding out that, okay, just the process, just from a business process perspective, they can no longer accept credit cards. Right? Because Visa said, nope, you guys have compromised. We're good. <laughs> you, lost, you lost that privilege. And so at hundreds of locations and hundreds of different restaurants, they have to get out those those little manual credit card functions <laughs> and pull it. So Matt, like, see, the last thing I want to do if I do, because that adds time to the process. If I'm going to get in, pay with my credit card, and they tell me, uh, no, we're not taking credit cards, or we've got to do it this way, we've got to do it manually, it takes a lot more time. And so their impact their business from a reputation perspective, from a from the perspective of that they lost, they undoubtedly lost revenue, because it took them so long, and you know, as a customer, I'm not going to wait an extra 30 minutes so you can get the impact is real. Anyway. I always had to get these on me somehow. Um, are we good, Joe? Uh, like one or two more minutes. One or two more minutes? <laughs> Entertainment industry.
do you think it pawned all the time? And they're big targets, right? So I mean, you, I'm sure you've heard like Sony, right? They got those. Um, yeah. And it, so it, the point is, is it doesn't matter how large you are and whether or not you think they're a target. Uh, PSN, so they were, they were uh, uh, so PSN, for example, originally they had, they, they, they had the attitude of why would anyone have this? No one wants it. I go through a serious, fundamental revaluation of security. You get um, so the Russians are attacked. ICS. This is a funny one. There's actually a book on this one. So not now. I'll follow up a little bit with this one, and we'll have some time for some questions. But uh, the Russians are attacked. So this is a few years ago. Uh, anyone here heard of ICS cert? So my so ICS cert is basically a government institution run by the. DHS that uh, will go out and do a basically free instant response for ICS customers. So you a power company and you get hacked and you're concerned, basically you go through this process and uh, DHS will send out these people to respond to the IR. Uh, my counterpart, his name is Eric, is the deputy director of that, uh, of that service. So and so one day we got this immediate urgent request that Hey, you know, we noticed a suspicious activity from Russia. Now, in order to get to his desk, it's got to go through like five other people. Right? So this one had gone all the way up to the joint seats of chat. Joint seats. Thank you. And they mandated that he's on the next plane out. So he got it. This was right during Thanksgiving. So he flew up to Illinois, middle of nowhere. He rode on an ATV to get to this water pump to figure out what is going on. So he looks at it. You know, I mean, in this in this time he hasn't slept in the day, you know, and uh, he's looking at it, he's trying to figure it out. He knows he's got like snacks and credentials, right? So he's like, well, who's the administrator of this account? They're like, well, it's so and so, right? He's the one that actually designed and built the software. Has anyone actually called him to see if this is valid traffic? Everyone looks. Did you call him? No, I didn't call him. Well, it turns out that this guy who built this interface is Russian, and he's been visiting his grandmother in Russia at that very time. But no one had actually called to verify that, hey, by the way, uh, are you in Russia and are you logged into this console? And so it turned into this huge government debacle because uh, think about all the money tax taxpayers like you and I uh, had to put the bill for last minute flights, ATV rentals, the whole nine yards. And, and, and simple, in an instant response, simply understanding if you are actually in an incident is pretty critical. Before you start raising the arms, but it's a really fun story. Uh, and like I said, because it shows you again you know, that not everything is as bad as it seems. Now, with that said, I mean you can find plenty of government malware that has been specifically designed to take on PLCs and uh, you know, stuff like that. Any questions? Oh, I got. So my next big concern is mobile. Mobile phone malware. We'll release a report probably at the end of the year with some really cool findings. Um, but if you think about it, who here uses two factor authentication in some form, right? So in your two factor authentication, what do you actually use for that, that second piece? Your phone, right? So if you're able to have malware on that phone and generate that as you're generating that random key, boom, you're done. So I think that's going to be you know, something to watch for. And like I said, I, I have seen specific examples of nation states you can have. Uh, but, uh, so, anyway, so that's that's pretty much it. I know we're at time, but uh, are there any questions? And if you and, and feel free to come up to me afterwards. If you have any questions about screen consulting, or you know, uh, let me know. Like I said, I, I'll uh, I'll give you the road there. Cool. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Everybody goes. I just want to make sure everybody is aware. Um, we are taking membership right now. If you want to become a member, some people asked, and maybe you want to log in. You need your shirts. Please stick around. We will be going back to the lab and we will pick them up. Um, and with that, look forward to seeing everybody next week or at the scale. And enjoy the rest of the week. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you.